All right, so we are super excited to be here today. Um, so thankful that you guys are joined us today. Beth Ann, Larry, Rosalind, thank you guys so much. Mark, thank you for being here. <laughs> and of course, Tom. So we're just gonna jump right into um, this webinar. I'm so excited Tom is here today. We've been doing um, weekly meetings, um, but this week we get to talk and chat with Tom. So let me just go ahead and give you his bio. We do have some interview questions that were already sent in. So we're going to read from that list. But of course, if you have a question that you need to get answered, definitely go ahead and submit it to the chat. If you are watching this after um, this is a re if this if you're watching the replay, make sure you go ahead and send us an email. You can do that at orders at antion.com and Tom will definitely get back to you or myself, Lakia, L-A-K-I-A at antion.com or Mark. Um, and we'll get back to you with those questions or with answers to those questions. Only if I like them. Only if he likes yeah, you. I don't like you then. <laughs> the person or the question? It goes in the spam. Either one. <laughs> <laughs> but you can always email me. I'll, I'll respond. All right. So let's just go ahead and give an intro really quick to Tom the man. <laughs> so Tom has been in business over 40 years formally and way more than that if you count all of his entrepreneurial endeavors starting at about 10 years old. Tom hit multimillionaire status over 20 years ago and has maintained that ever since. So as you can see, he definitely knows a lot about um, the skills that you need to, to create a thriving business. So Tom, are you ready? I am ready. I know you have I a small ready. announcement before we get started. So I'm just going to go ahead and let you do that. And then we have some questions. Yeah, I almost said, I am ready to screw the commute because that's my new <laughs> podcast coming up. So uh, hello, everybody. I hope you're doing well in the school. Um, I just wanted to just uh, give a little introduction about the, the value of business and being in business. I mean, this is the easiest country in the world, if you happen to be in the U.S. watching this, to start a business. And it's the best time in history to start a business because we have all these tools you're learning about that I didn't have when I was coming up through business. We had nothing compared to what you have now. Um, but I want you to start a business, even if you're at a job now or if you want to get a big job, there's still a big value of being in business. And primarily, uh, one of the major reasons is tax deductions. See, when you're a W-2 employee and you just go to work and get a paycheck, virtually nothing is deductible uh, for you other than your standard deductions and all that stuff. But when you're in business, you can take off all kinds of legitimate things. And I'm not trying to... Uh, my accountant's not even that aggressive. We just, we take off stuff that, that allows me to keep the money rather than give it away to buy bombs and whatever else the government throws it away on. So, so I want you to be in that, that boat. Uh, there's so many deductible things and that can be a whole other discussion or we might do an elective on starting a business. Um, but, uh, one of the things is making your hobbies tax deductible. I'm a big proponent of that. That's why I have the Fatso Tennis site. I have dog sites and things that I love to do. So I made a business out of them. And it's so easy to do by putting up a $100 world-class looking WordPress site and either selling a product of your own or you don't even have to have a product to make this a hobbies tax deductible thing work. You could do an affiliate product for somebody else. As long as you're uh, legitimately attempting to make money, it's perfectly legitimate to take tax deductions. So, um, so I really want you to do that. The other big thing I want you to think about is, is it's an insurance policy. Some of you may know I've been sitting in this chair. Well, I've been sitting in this chair maybe five months, but the two months before that, I was laid up in bed with a, a hole this bit, this long in my stomach that's still not healed up after eight months because I got in an accident. And other than the initial trauma and so forth, I was back doing business within a week after a major operation. So uh, this, is a, this is an insurance policy for you and your family that you can keep money coming in when life gets in the way. And some of you may 
uh, recall the story of my when my mother went south on me and and I had to move her out of our family home after 50 years. I took off three months from this business, and I, I think I got the, the figures right because it's been a little while. But I, I think I came back in February. We did 90,000. January 120,000, and March maybe 140,000. And I was not even here. All right. And many of my friends said they would have been bankrupt had they. Uh, taken off three months to take care of their family or their mother. So it's so really important what you're doing here. I know it can get bogged down with details of, of keywords and all the little things you have to fool with in the social media, but the payoff is really, really big for you. So, so that's pretty yeah. much what I wanted to talk about. Two other things uh, real quick is um, opp an opportunity for you to promote the school. You're in the school. Hopefully you see the value of it. And the tuition that none of you, uh, well, some of you may have paid this. I don't know how, uh, how everybody got in here, but the tuition is $19,100. And there's a very big commission in it if you refer the school. And people can get in. We finance it for them with a thousand, uh, at least $1,000 down. But if they pay the whole thing, you can get a big chunk of money all at once. And if we finance it for them every month, will send you money. So it's a recurring income for you. So that's one thing. Second thing is, is I want you to uh, help me promote my new podcast called Screw the Commute. So if you write this down, screwthecommute.com slash team, I've got a bunch of perks for helping me out on that. So there we go. Let it rip, Lakia. Oh, and I also just want to piggyback off what you said. It is, as you guys already know, I had the injury and I've been able to work from home for the past, what, four months. So I am just so grateful for that. And that sucks because I need extra people to answer the phone. Yeah. <laughs> really but my leg is recovering. So thank you guys also for your prayers and well wishes and all of that great stuff. So let's jump into some of the interview questions that we have today. And Mark is Mark has them too. Um, step in whenever you want, but I have a question for you. So what's the first step that you should take when you own an online business or just an online or an offline business? Do you think you should just, the first thing is to get a business license? Like we hear so many things about having a business license. Um, should that be the first step that you take? No, the first step is the, I think it's the first class in the school is your keyword research. Before you do anything, don't spend a nickel, don't, come up with a name for your company, don't do a thing until you see if your idea is viable. So keyword research is still the number one thing of all that you do before you start a business. Okay. I don't know how much, how deep you want me to go on each question. No, that's good. Limited that on time, good. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, let me, well, I'll just piggyback off of that. The, uh, the mechanics of starting a business are so easy. You can, uh, look at type it into your local uh, to your locale because the rules are different in every little place but basically you're going to get a business license which could be 10 or 15 dollars or something you're going to take that to the bank because you're going to need a commercial checking account although you don't have to have it to start but it's uh, handy to have a commercial account rather than a personal account mm -hmm. and uh, you're going to file a schedule c on your regular tax forms and then boom, you're in business already. So, so that's about it. And any other little thing that your community desires. Now, one thing, many of us work out of our homes and a lot of places still have old laws on the books that it's illegal to work out of your home. But you know, that's so antiquated. Nobody's ever been convicted in that since Superman was a baby. And uh, it just doesn't, uh, happen. And if you're not making a lot of noise and having people coming in and out of your house all day long, nobody will even know you're mm -hmm. in business. So that's a, the low end way to get started. Okay. And of course, we're going to be jumping all around. Um, but my next question is, I mean, you've been in business for quite some time. How do you deal with high maintenance clients? And have you ever turned a client down or away? Uh, yes, I've absolutely uh, done that. Now, it's easier after you become very well off right, to do this. In the beginning, it's very difficult because you're looking at that stack of bills 
and this one client's a pain in the neck and you might need the money. So sometimes you just have to suck it up and, and go with them. But you want to get yourself to the point as fast as possible. You keep your expenses really low. You get some cash in the bank so that you're not desperate to take every client because you can get a bad taste in your mouth by taking rotten clients. Mm -hmm. So uh, get to that point as soon as possible. But folks, uh, if you want all the riches and the wonderful lifestyle things that can come from this business, uh, sometimes you have to, it's, it's harder in the beginning than it will be later because you might have to work a job to keep money coming in while you're building your business. So you have to get the mindset that no matter what, I'm going to do this. And then when these obstacles come up or these pain in the neck clients come up, you just scratch and claw through it. And that's been the key to my success. I'm no kind of brilliant person. I'll tell you the truth, I, I never had an original thought in my whole life. <laughs> it's, it's, I never quit. I'm unstoppable. But my dad made me that way. So if you have that attitude, you're going to get through those bad clients to the point where you can tell the rest of them to take a hike eventually. So the, the first idea that you ever had for a business, like how did that come about? Like how did you start moving towards entrepreneurship? Well, uh, I was probably 10 years old and uh, my dad was a, a master electrician. And he had been entrepreneurial his whole life, but uh, uh, he, he had a big setback with one of his entrepreneurial endeavors with no fault of his own, which I can kind of relate to. Um, but uh, he was able to bring home a, a lot of uh, what they call uh, copper, temporary light fixture copper from these major enormous jobs he was working on. And so he basically taught me for my spending money to be able to strip the insulation off and then he would help me haul it into the junkyard and I got uh, 30 cents a pound for old crappy copper and 75 cents a pound. And this is, I mean, we're talking a long time ago uh, for really beautiful new copper. And so I made, uh, it, I turned into a business. I started being a little scrap man <laughs> basically. And, uh, uh, so it was my dad stimulated a lot of these to start with, and then I got the rolling on it. And then I bought my first used car when I was 15 years old and didn't even have a, a learner's permit, fixed it up and sold it and made $180 profit. I was hooked. You know, this is, this is the way to go for me. It was, uh, not going to work for somebody else. Okay. So I have a question that was sent in by Lori. Lori F, because I do not know how to say her last name. <laughs> um, not sure if it's really possible to answer this question, but if anyone can, Tom can. I believe I saw an ebook or a discussion related to this on public speaking, on his public speaking site. I am not really creative when it comes to thinking of catchy names that will grab people's attention or encourage them to look at, on my website for additional information or articles like Tom. Example, Fat Soul Tennis, I Am Not a Poodle, or and Butt Camp. Does Tom have any suggestions for how to get the creative juices flowing for getting people interested in holding their attention? Yeah, and, and if, you, if you really don't feel that you have that in you, like I, I know I have it in me, but, um, there are formulas for some of these things. So for instance, the, I think some inordinate amount, 70 to 80% of New York Times bestsellers have three words or less in their title. And then they have a subtitle that describes what it, it's about. So if you go through the New York Times bestseller list, you'll start seeing patterns of like, oh, look, they had a really punchy title and then they just clearly said how to so and so and so and so. So there's formulas for this. So you could actually type into Google uh, uh, book title formulas and you'll find all kinds of things out there that if you just filled in the blanks with your stuff, you don't really have to be that creative to, to have something that actually works. So don't, um, of course, I want you to improve on things, but I don't want you to, to, 
coin yourself as not creative and then sit there and, and mull over it for the rest of your life. No, go out and find the tools that help you get the job done. I don't care if you ever become creative. I want you to get the job done ethically and morally and these tools and formulas will help you. So don't fret about it. Just go out and, and do some Google search. In fact, there's that funny website that says, let me Google that for you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because all these tech people ask these tech people these simple questions and uh, they're just going to go Google it to get the answer. Mm -hmm. So look for book title formulas. And then if you follow up, I have two articles on titling things that I did not write, but I really love them, and I can make them available to uh, Lakia and Mark to get distribute to everybody. But don't fret about it. It doesn't matter about creativity. You have to just be good, solid, honest, and give people what they want. Okay. Mark? After that, just a little bit. If you don't think that you're creative, most most of us are on the, online somewhere um, and we're following somebody or we enjoy watching somebody else that's online and usually they might be really good at being creative follow them you don't have to copy them word for word but you kind of see what they're doing maybe change it into your own language and then that's a way to kind of build off of the other creative people yeah that's called a swipe file in copywriting and that uh, you see something you like, you take it and then you don't use it word for word. You just adapt it a little bit. And that's way easier than thinking it up in the first place. Mm -hmm. So once you think it up and you have maybe a, your, your business name or whatever name, do you think it's important to trademark your business name or? I get that question all the time. And my, my first answer always is, if you did trademark your name, do you have enough money to defend the trademark in court if somebody infringes on it? Mm -hmm. You have an extra half a million laying around if some company puts 40 lawyers on you and, and most people say no. So uh, your job as a small business person is to get out there and make, a, make the money. And then if you have extra money on the side, then you can trademark things. Now, of course, I, I'm not qualified to give you legal advice. A lawyer would say, sure, absolutely, you need to trademark that. That's great. Yeah. But the, the thing is, is if some big company comes in and infringes on your trademark, they will crush you into a blip. If they bothered to do that, first of all, and knowingly infringed on your trademark, they're going to crush you like a mortar and pestle and watch you just, psh, you know, because you can't afford to defend it in court. So uh, I would say concentrate your funds on building up something where somebody wouldn't even dare try to steal it because you're the one known for it, like butt camp. One guy in Europe tried to do butt camp and I called him, I think I threatened to kill him or something and then he quit. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. But uh, uh, you get known for something and then if there's enough money and it's worth it, then you can go the trademark route. But uh, to spend money on that in the beginning, unless you're really flush with a lot of money, is uh, doesn't make sense to me. Okay. So, okay. Did you have a specific financial goal in mind that you needed to achieve, maybe a profit goal um, to keep going or maybe shut your business down? So if you just... I did, uh, okay. Uh, okay, I did not. I, I, I was, there was no way I was going to shut my business down. <laughs> I was going to make it work. And I, uh, when I, lost my nightclub and a lot of you don't know that but in 1988 i was i had the same injury as lakia had the torn achilles tendon mm -hmm. the partner i had had uh, canceled the insurance didn't tell me but i had lost my nightclub because the drinking age went from 18 to 21 and wiped me out so uh, what was the question again i got off on a tangent <laughs> <laughs> um, let me find it again. Did you have a, spe a specific oh, the financial goal? Right, mm -hmm. right. So uh, when I thought up the idea for this crazy entertainment company called Prank Masters, uh, I moved to Washington, D.C., and I had no financial goals. And it was sticker shock. I mean, the rents were like four to five times what they were where I was coming from and never been to the big city before. Uh, but I... It was just, I'm going to make this work. And me and uh, had a roommate. We ate chicken dogs for six months just to survive and keep the rent paid and, and keep get the business going. 
And then uh, doing that long enough uh, and doing a good job, I got a break and boom, it blew up. And so, uh, so there wasn't any specific financial goals. There was keep the bills paid, keep your credit good, and um, don't quit. Just don't quit. Do you ever find yourself in need of encouragement as an entrepreneur? And if so, um, how do you stay encouraged? Yeah, encouraged, motivated, so forth. I'm kind of a loner. I mean, I came up as the baby of six boys living out in the boondocks of uh, no man's land in Western Pennsylvania. And so I had to amuse myself and encourage myself to things because I was, it was like the three stooges where Curly has nobody to smack. You know, so so uh, I had to learn to uh, motivate myself. And one of the tricks that I've used uh, to this day is that I announce that I'm going to do something to the world and no matter how crazy it is. And then I'm too embarrassed to not make it happen. <laughs> so when times get tough, I'm still scratching and crawling because I don't want to be that guy that they say, Oh, he's just a big dreamer. And, you know, and it's happened over and over when I took over the nightclub, people say, no, you can't do it. It won't work in that area. Boom. I made it work. Although the drinking age made it not work, but still I did what I said I was going to do. Then I said, I'm going to start a practical joke company because I was tired of getting hit with beer bottles. People say, that's crazy. You'll never do that. Boom. Worldwide publicity, 4,000 jobs around Washington, DC, got me in the speaking business. Um, then I was going to start this retreat center I'm sitting in right now. A couple million dollar facility. Ah, that's crazy. The people, you're going to let people stay in your home? Are you nuts? Yeah, I am. And they, and I'm the only facility in this world that's been operating 16 years now doing this and uh, helped make me a fortune. So I announced all this stuff before I actually did it. And then I was going to fight. I mean, even the, the financing on this place, they said, oh, you can't get a no money down deal on this. You're crazy. I got a no money down deal on this place. <laughs> now, I didn't take it, all right, because it wasn't as good a deal as a 5% down deal. So uh, I didn't take it, but I did it. So I announced things. That's the mental game that I play with myself. And then I don't need motivated. The motivation is I do not want to be embarrassed of being the guy that can't do what he said he's going to do. Okay. Good stuff. Okay. So we know you have Antion and Associates, um, Prank Masters. How, like, what is your business structure? Okay. Well, <laughs> Uh, first of all, the overriding principle is, is I do not want you blowing money on ridiculously overpriced stuff that doesn't help you. I want your money only to be spent on things that can create revenue for you uh, or create infrastructure, the, the absolute necessities. So I started my business in, 19, I mean, technically, Prank Masters Incorporated was started in 1988 with a $50 book uh, written by Ted Nicholas on how to start your own corporation for 50 bucks. I still operate to this day under that corporate umbrella. It's based out of Delaware is where a lot of the, the, the corporations are based out of. And if you go anywhere and ask to start me a corporation, any lawyer is going to be 1500 bucks or 2500 bucks or something like that. So that's just an indication of my thinking of how you get to have a lot of money if you don't blow it on things unnecessary. So um, I, oper I still operate to this day. Uh, something says the meeting's been upgraded to something or other, to more minutes. I don't know. So... I still operate to this day under Prank Masters Incorporated and Antion and Associates and Anchor Publishing are DBAs called Doing Business As. And so it's still under Prank Masters and it, uh, your paychecks come out of <laughs> Prank Masters. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I have to write a check to somebody that doesn't know me and they look at it, Prank Master. Yeah. <laughs> I don't but I don't care. You know, I'm a little eccentric, obviously, but I don't really care. And I just do my regular business under the DBA of Antion Associates and Anchor Publishing. So um, I keep the cost low. So I don't blow a lot of fees. I have almost zero legal fees in all the years I've been in business. See, because I don't do, you know, I take care of customers so they don't sue me. 
and I don't do things that are dangerous or hurt people. So, uh, and then you got to get good insurance too, because I have the protection dog company and you know, that's a dangerous thing. So I've got insurance for that, but, um, you just got to keep your expenses very, very low. And I do operate as a corporation, but that doesn't mean that you should right off the bat uh, because a lot of people, I think one of the questions was about that, Lakia, about corporate or LLC. Yeah. But, um, a lot of people do that because they think it's going to protect them personally. But that's a big joke. I mean, lawyers laugh at that for small companies because they do what they call pierce the corporate veil. So if you go and run over somebody in your balloon delivery truck, so run over some little kid and you're a corporation and think, well, I'm safe. No, you're not. They're going to they're gonna skewer you to the wall and cut through that corporation. So unless your accountant uh, you know, tells you there's a, a good solid reason tax-wise to operate as that, or you're getting so big where and you are holding meetings and corporate taking notes and you got a secretary for all this stuff then uh it's it's just uh it's just a waste of money to to do all the fancy corporate stuff if it's not going to do what it's supposed to do to protect mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you can start with just a schedule c on your taxes and you are in business good stuff so what about people who are they're maybe not starting out but they're moving further in their business they're making money would you um like are there any services that they can connect with um like websites or people that can do that for them to help help them incorporate well uh, uh, yeah there's uh there's legal zoom is a as an online service but um if you just got that book i think it's still in print from ted nicholas i mean it's just filling out some papers and sending them to delaware and then uh, depending on what state you're in, you, you are a foreign, like I'm a foreign corporation, not like from Russia, not mm -hmm. colluding on my corporation, uh, a foreign corporation because it's actually domiciled in Delaware. And then you have to pay a fee to, to somebody in Delaware every year just to keep it all current, but it's the very minimal. Uh, expenses. So you can do it yourself or you could go to legal zoom, but if you go to an attorney, it's just going to jack the price up yeah. a lot, you know, and you're not going to get anything better out of it. really. Okay. So we're going to wrap up this meeting, but I have one more question. Well, that's it. Jeez. I didn't even get warmed up yet. <laughs> Jeez. Or actually we have two questions. You, you answered some of the questions in your other questions. Oh, okay. All right. So um, I have a question. I got a question you didn't oh, okay. answer. Who's that? It's me, it's Mark. Mark. <laughs> I got a question you didn't answer, and some people I know have asked in the past, and I really don't know what your opinion is. Um, let's say they before they even have a business, they're getting the business license. Let's say somebody has two ideas for a business. Now, one of these businesses could be very successful, but they're not very excited about it. Or it's or the other idea is something a little bit riskier, but it's more of a passion. What would you advise that person to do? Okay, well, first of all, it has to, uh, your goals uh, or your immediate goals have to be taken into account. Are you a person that's me that's single, and other than taking care of my dogs, I don't have any responsibilities, uh, so I can be riskier and not worry about my kids getting something to eat, or is it really necessary that I make the money? So if it's really necessary, I make the money, it's gotta be towards the one that's more of a sure deal. Mm -hmm. uh, even if you don't like it, it's like I said, you gotta suck it up and pay your dues until you get to the point where you can uh, back off and just do things like that dumb trailer I built all last summer. It's got <laughs> $6,000 in it and a big hole in my stomach because I got in an accident. So, um, so, I would say if your goal is to uh, security for your family, go with the less risky, even if it's uh, a bigger hassle for you and then build the business up and sell it off when you get in good shape and then do your passion or do them both if you can possibly handle it. But if you just, there's so many people say, Oh, do the, do what you love and the money will follow. <laughs> that is not true. You do what you love that, and it's making you broke, you better rethink that to that idea. And we have a lot of people 
that we've been through this class that wanted to do stuff that refused to do the keyword research. They just love this topic that nobody on earth wanted except them. And they, they go broke doing it. So uh, passion is uh, doing something passionately is only if it has the same ability to make money as the one that's not as passionate. You have another one, Mark? I have something else. I have two more. Well, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you can if you want. <laughs> um, so we have on here, what do you look for in an employee? I'm terrible at picking employees. You can see that, right? <laughs> no, actually, uh, uh, I'm more interested in attitude than skills because you can teach skills, but if the employee has a crappy attitude, then, uh, you know, I'm not much of a hand holder. You all know that. If, if I never had to, I mean, I like you personally, but if I have never had to speak to any of you again, <laughs> I wouldn't miss you. <laughs> All right. No, I love I love you guys. You've been around a long time, but I don't. I'm not a hand holder. I'm not there every minute. Like, all right, Mark, what'd you do from 10:15 to 11:15? You know, mm -hmm. he probably wouldn't be here because he the way he got here in the first place is because <laughs> somebody wanted to make him wear a tie. I I guarantee you, he doesn't have shoes on right now. All right. <laughs> so <laughs> right, <laughs> stick your foot up there. Right? <laughs> so. Uh, so I look for attitude and somebody that can work on their own uh, without me supervising and, and comes through. I get it that they're going to, you know, fool around a little bit here and there. But as long as the, the big job gets done and they're uh, loyal, kind of loyal to the company, and in other words, not bad mouthing me every, you know, every time you turn around, then uh, uh, the attitude is, is the most important thing as long as they're smart enough to be trained to do the job they need to do. So okay. it's attitude over skill. So, okay. So um, I thought um, questions in here. Um, so do you then, use a, a professional accountant or attorney? I do use an accountant, but I didn't write in the beginning. So, uh, but, and I don't even have an attorney to turn to right this moment other than for my TV show in Hollywood but he wouldn't handle any business stuff here um, because I never get in trouble or never do anything that requires <laughs> it. But an accountant after you get going is, is important. A bookkeeper and then an accountant. Absolutely. Um, let's see. I saw some other stuff on here. Yeah. And what I have another one too. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so what would you, would you partner with someone like, say if someone came to you, Tom, you have this strength, I have that strength, can we work together? Um, have you done that in the past? Uh, what qualifies would, that person? I would probably do that if um, somehow I became brain dead and they were holding an Uzi up into my mouth. They're gonna <laughs> blow my brain. Um, it's, it's a la it should be a last resort. Uh, now, mm. collaborating with people but not, see, when you use the term partner, that's a legal term. Yeah, that's. Collaborating yeah. or being an affiliate or, you know, a, a joint venture, those are all temporary things. But a partner, it's so easy to become a partner with somebody, but it's very, very difficult to not become a partner with that person. Mm. Very easy to become a partner, very difficult to get out of it. So you, if you, uh, and I, I try to get people don't think that you need all this help. You have all these tools on in, online that can do stuff for you like crazy. You can hire freelancers. You can outsource to the Philippines. The last thing you want is a partner that's going to take part of the money. And I haven't heard of one in recent years that people aren't disappointed because the other partner just doesn't hold their share up, but they want the money. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, I've been in one in my whole life and it was a disaster. Ended up with a big lawsuit. The guy was a crazy idiot and built a building that was going to fall down on all my patrons. And I mean, it's just a, a mess. So uh, I, I have a bad uh, taste in my mouth from that. But still, in all of the, the history of my in business, I've just seen partnerships. Everybody's complaining about one or the other not holding their load. So Learn to do it yourself, outsource what you don't need, keep 100% control whenever humanly possible. Okay, let's see. Um, 
how, what do I attribute my success? Uh, persistence and consistency. People know what to expect from me and they know I won't quit. If there's something worth going after, uh, you just keep going, going, going like the Energizer Bunny. But you got to be consistent and treat people fairly. And uh, that's, uh, that's the success. Uh, what do you, what do you, like, what are some of your business goals? Like, and how do you determine what you're going to do next? Well, you have to watch the marketplace. Uh, like, for instance, I'm starting this podcast. When I have a lot of people on here, Rosalind probably heard me in a speech somewhere, uh, poo poo podcast for years. But times change. And the whole <laughs> thing is, is keeping up with the times. And that's where a lot of old farts like me don't. They just, you know, retire and drop dead after a while. Uh, but, you know, I keep up with things myself and through you young people and uh, change with the time. So I'm doing a podcast because the times have changed. Uh, newspaper and TV ads are not as effective. So all these companies have money to pour into other methods, sponsorship uh, to reaching people. Uh, GM just came out and said that they're making their new cars podcast ready. Podcasts have exceeded listenership of XM radio and it's free. And so it's a whole new market for me of people that would never sit down and watch my webinars, but they'll listen to me by the thousands. And then I'll start a big revenue stream selling stuff that, uh, that other, you know, my main list is all heard about, but these people haven't, these new people. So you got to keep up with the times. That's, um, that's the thing. And so my goal is to, pay attention to the marketplace and give them what they want within my ethical and moral bounds, which are, you know, not that, not that big, but, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, so, so anyway, it's, it's, you go with the flow and you don't get stuck. I mean, there's some guy, big, big name author came up and said, business plans are ridiculous because by the time you get done making one, it's obsolete, just like the, our school. That's why we have to upgrade the curriculum. So Things are moving so fast nowadays that planning too far ahead is ridiculous. And you'll just be disappointed. So mine is always short, short-term goals is what I, I do. And, uh, and, and they all don't work. Heck no, they don't work. But, but if you just keep going, 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 you find the ones that do work. You know, I failed, like many people say, I failed way more than I've succeeded. But then I brag about the successes and all you suckers go ahead and buy my stuff. <laughs> 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 and so speaking of the podcast, um, again, Tom mentioned earlier that um, we are looking for people to be a part of our launch and um, release team. So if you're listening right now and you want to join us, go on over to screwthecommute.com forward slash team. team and mm -hmm. sign up because we definitely need you and this is going to and be we have perks for you too we'll give you a shout out for you and your website on a future episode and discounts and yeah and he just literally gave someone um he posted a question they needed some help on the podcast to see um if they could download it and someone responded within a second and she won a consultation what worth what a consultation yeah yeah, so that was pretty cool. And I'm like, where's mine? I want a consultation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's go back to really quick um, business plan. That was a question on here. Um, did you start, did you create one in the very beginning? I know you said that you- I've only done one in my entire life uh, because it was required by the state of Virginia to get to school. Only one I ever created my entire life. The, um, and, and it's just full of just stuff that's, you know, kind of worthless, but you, you know, going through it is a, is a good exercise to really open your eyes to the prospects of your business. So I did it, dreaded every second of it, but, uh, there's software you can buy that leads you through it. So that's what I did. I just, I don't remember what it was, but there's tons of, uh, business plan software, but just don't get too wrapped up in it. I mean, if you have to do it, great if you want to learn something by doing it great but the chances of it being accurate in the long run in today's environment are very slim so don't get uh, feel like it's the be all end all uh, of anything because it's not it used to be but not anymore and this will be the last <laughs> question um how did you research your market for your businesses and specifically prank masters like how did you 
get that ball rolling? Well, uh, prank masters, um, you know, I, I said I, I've always done things that nobody's done before. So uh, starting the nightclub and, you know, doing the stuff that I do that nobody's done before. So this was long before punk or any of those things even existed. But I was watching Candid Camera. I was laid up like you were with the same injury and uh, watching Candid Camera. And I said, you know what? People love this. They just love this. They <laughs> watch this, but they couldn't really participate unless they lived in California and happened to get caught by the can camera. So that's where it spawned the idea. I was doodling a little devil sticking his tongue out at you. And that's my uh, logo for it. It's hanging up in the office where you used to sit all the time. And, um, and then I just said, well, you know, I knew how to keep costs really low. I knew I'd have to be in a big city to make it happen. Also, one of the impetus was I was tired. I was in gunfights and knife fights and bikers trying to kill me. And it was in over 100 violent encounters with people at the nightclub. I thought, you know, whatever I do is going to be fun. And it was almost like the passion thing Mark was talking about. It's going to be fun. And for me and the people that I deal with and nobody's going to hit me with beer bottles. And, you know, so, so I said, I don't care. I'm going to give it a try. So there wasn't any kind of research. It was just so unique that I thought I could make it happen because I'd been really very good at getting publicity. And when you have unique, crazy stuff like that, you can get publicity. And I ended up being on the radio and TV all over the world because of this. And I was on the Tokyo Today show. <laughs> I mean, they wanted to know, we had this guy that was 450 pounds and he did an act called a moonogram. The message was actually written on his butt. Right? And so the <laughs> Japanese people say, what is a moonogram? <laughs> so it's very hard to, to interpret that in Japanese. I guess. But, uh, so we had all kinds of fun and crazy stories. And like I said, it got worldwide publicity and that kicked off my speaking career and got me down here, got me to meet you all all that stuff so so that one didn't have it but the school um, if you really are doing a, a more standard business I went to uh, the government all the government statistic places you know I wanted to see okay they're outsourcing all the the um, programming jobs so a programming school was probably not the best idea but they're not outsourcing marketing jobs to other countries to Pakistan or India because people want the US mindset for marketing so that was a big thing on my application to the state of why this could be successful so you have a lot of uh, statistics and government things that have done studies that you couldn't afford to do so you compile all those and you know you have to look at it you can't slant it with your mind to say well i think this is going to work even if the numbers are saying no there's no chance it's going to work you have to be careful of that but uh, you can research enough to see, okay, uh, this is the size of the market. Uh, it's a growing market. It's a declining market. I mean, I don't think you'd want to go into the CD duplication business right now, right? Yeah. Uh, or, I mean, kids, less new kids don't even know what CDs are, you know? So, so I know, I think uh, it might have been Rosalind or somebody was you know, complaining about um, the CD class in the school but still there's a gift market and old farts still know how to shove a cd yeah. in their dashboard so that's why we still have it there uh but it, it'll go away uh, soon so and you know uh, I, I was at something that was interesting too about the cd duplication industry um i was on i think it was youtube looking up something like some workouts and they're in the comments the lady asked the um youtuber hey can you make these available on DVD because I need them. Um, I don't have a computer and it's easier for me to just pop it in there. So I was just like, oh, that's pretty interesting. So yeah, um, I have the ability to do it, but I mean, you got to get a CD, a DVD burner now because a lot of computers don't even have them on anymore. So, but uh, anyway, times change and you, uh, you just have to do the research and see what the future holds. You can't just, you know, look at it right this moment. So with the internet stuff, you know, I knew that's a, an increasing business like crazy and it will be for many years to come. So that was a, a no brainer. But the, the thing about the programming jobs being outsourced, but not the marketing, that was a big uh, thing on the scales of justice to say, oh, this is going to work. And so I have, basically I have, research. Yeah. What? 
I have another question I was just thinking about. A lot of times you hear, um, you get these entrepreneurs and they started way back when um, you started in 94. If you had to start on, all online, I started on 94. Yeah, online, start yeah. online in 94. That was when the commercial internet started, yeah. Yeah, so in 2018, is there anything you would do different if you had to start over? Is there a, um, maybe a product that you would probably um, focus on more or a, I don't know, um, just anything different you, anything, anything different I would have done. Um, I probably would have hired people sooner. The only time I, I hired uh, people just to expand the amount of products, which I got loads and loads of products now, but, yeah. but, uh, the, um, uh, you know, I was making a fortune and I had one part-time temp person working here. And this, the only time I started hiring people was when uh, the accountant called me up and he said, Hey man, you have too much retained earnings. And I said, well, that's good. Right. You know, well, he said, no, you're going to get extra tax. And I said, what? I've been keeping my nose clean and I'm not buying boats and airplanes and everything. He said, no, you're going to pay more taxes. So that's when I got mad and started hiring people. I said, I'd rather buy, uh, pay for jobs than bonds. Mm -hmm. So I, I would have done that sooner so that I could expand it. And uh, one, I, I know this guy is a billionaire and he, I was at his house and he was, he said, Tom, you should be sitting by the pool and just thinking all day long. And then having everybody else do this stuff. And I, I'm, I'm more blue collar and not that big of a thinker. So, so I, I like to have my hands in things. But, but I would have um, hired people sooner to, um, to accelerate things. And they were going great as it was. But, uh, you know, I was doing everything, including one thing we didn't talk about is payroll. You know, there's uh, one thing if you got to be careful of trying to call somebody a contractor, an independent contractor if they're not, because you will get zapped for all the back payroll taxes. So you get places like paychecks. I was doing payroll by hand, which was, you know, you're going looking at the chart and taking the, writing the checks by hand. So paychecks or Patriot software or cheap places now that will handle all those payroll things. So the IRS doesn't come after you. Your part-time person, and seriously, this is the last one, your part-time person, um, what exactly do they do for you in that role to help? Okay, well, this is interesting because if you work out of your home, temp places, uh, there was only one I could <laughs> find in all of Virginia Beach is the biggest city in Virginia that would allow somebody to work in a home. You know, mm -hmm. so I didn't have much to pick from. So, so I got one part-time temp person that worked in my office and she was basically just doing paperwork and billing stuff. I mean, before I had the shopping cart, I was doing a finance option on, on the bigger products, right? But then I'd lose the paperwork and forget to charge people. And, you know, it was just so yeah. crazy. So she was doing that kind of stuff and uh, answering the phone and uh, filing stuff and, you know, making, putting products together for me because it was, all, uh, I mean, yeah, we had eBooks at that time, but there was still the, the wake them up speaking system was all DVD and, we had a lot of physical products at that time. So she was putting those, taking them to the post office, things like that. Awesome. So she was a gen. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, Tom, for being with us today. Um, all of our guests that were here, Larry, Beth Ann, um, Rosalind. Thank you guys. Mark. Um, there hey, will be. Funny. Your, your, your name is on your, my name is on your picture. Yes. Yes. And I didn't know how to change that. So I was just like, just roll, with it. <laughs> just roll with it. Um, again, thank you guys so much. If you're watching the replay and you have any questions, um, definitely send them over to me, Lakia at Antion.com or send it over to orders at Antion and we will get back to you. As soon screw as the commute. Screw the commute yes. slash team. We're going to roll this uh, pretty uh, maybe this week. So uh, this coming week. Yeah, so screwthecommute.com forward slash team and all the information is there and we will be excited for you to join our team. So again, talk to you guys soon and we will have an awesome weekend. Bye. All righty. Ending meeting. I'll make sure I make sure. Okay.